So uh, welcome to my uh, talk on uh, from volutes on preference to model policing on women in Iran, a 360 degree view of gender bias. And I first uh, thank the organizers to, uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Um, I will first like to start with a quick uh, overview of my uh, research program. And before that, I would like to give an unsafe content alert. So because we work on harmful speech, so some of the example slides will contain some offensive uh, sentences. So I already apologize to my audience uh, beforehand. So I will first give a quick snapshot of, of my research. My research program consists of three different strands. And in each of these strands, I try to make both substantive and methodological contributions. The first one, I look into US political landscape, and I try to build robust methods to quantify uh, political polarization. And I also work on uh, uh, critical issues like Capitol riot or George Floyd's murder and the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, some of this work uh, have been highlighted uh, in prominent outlets uh, such as uh, New York Times, uh, Wired, and, and many more. In the second strand, I work on international politics. And uh, there I have worked on globally in important events such as uh, the 2019 India-Pakistan conflict or the Rohingya refugee crisis. And the focused uh, focus areas of these lines of work is how to build uh, novel frameworks to counterbalance hate with positive content and also how to democratize natural language processing through uh, low resource natural language processing methods. I have also worked on other important uh, uh, events in South Asia, like the 2019 Indian election or sustainability challenges in India, and also the 2022 Iranian civil unrest. And in the final stand, I uh, work on responsible AI, where the goal is to audit uh, platforms data sets and large language models for unintended harm. Uh, for example, one of the words that got a, a lot of attention where we showed that hate speech classifiers, when uh, they are fed uh, harmless, benign chess discussions, they often misclassify them as uh, hate speech because of the presence of words like black, white, kill, capture, attack, and threat. And uh, we also conducted another uh, responsible AI uh, research uh, uh, recently, where we looked into a novel phenomena, what we called inappropriate content hallucination, where we found that speech to text methods, since they are primarily trained on conversations between adults, when we use those ASR systems and apply them to uh, videos of children, they often uh, miss, uh, create very harmful errors. And some of these errors, uh, uh, for example, here, Ryan is saying that you should also find corn and the ASR system uh, inaccurately outputs, you should also find porn. And we did a very large scale analysis of several children's videos. And we found that many uh, of these videos actually have this inappropriate content, content hallucination. And the good thing about this work was when this got published and got a lot of attention, some of these high risk, uh, high visible errors were fixed from uh, YouTube. So now if you go to this video, you will see that Ryan is saying uh, you should also find corn and the uh, subtitles also indicate that you should also uh, find, buy corn. So some of our work has already had some, um, some uh, platform level uh, impact. Now, the focus of this talk is uh, gender bias in diverse settings, and I'll be covering six papers published at Cell Press Patterns and HKI, and each of them uh, will present a unique vantage point of gender bias. The first work uh, is uh, the Cell Press Patterns uh, paper. It's a joint work with my student Kunal and my mentor, uh, Tom Mitchell. And in this work, we looked into uh, subtitles of economically successful movies from Bollywood and Hollywood uh, for seven decades. And we looked into 100 top grossing films from each decade and 1,400 movie subtitles. And we studied what kind of gender and societal biases are present there. And spoiler alert, we did find that Bollywood has an obsession with fair skin. And there is a sun preference, which I'll be talking about soon. 
So we looked into many subtle bias signals. For example, we tracked how dowry, a uh, retrograde social practice, uh, where uh, the groom's family demands uh, financial assets from the bride's family during the wedding, uh, how dowry is portrayed in Bollywood movies for the last 70 years, and how son preference, when there is a, a newborn baby, how often the family wants that baby to be a son as opposed to daughter, uh, which has been uh, documented in extensively in social science literature, how son preference mani manifests in Bollywood movies. And we also found that these two uh, uh, topics are kind of interlinked. And we find that uh, the trajectory of both perception of dowry and son preference over time in, in an interlinked way. So this is a, a known technique that we applied to track the nearest neighbors of the word dowry over the last uh, seven decades. And we found that between 1950s to 1960s, the nearest neighbors of the word dowry is like money, loan, debt, jewelry, indicating compliance. Whereas in 1970, we start seeing the word like cons consent, responsibility, those kind of words are appearing as nearest neighbors. And finally, in uh, 2000, post 2000, we see uh, words like indicating non-compliance, like div divorce, guts, those kind of words are coming up. So we can see that the perception of dowry slowly became from move from move from compliance to non-compliance. And similarly, we tracked phases such as congratulations or it's a boy, it's a girl. And, and we wanted to uh, estimate whenever there is a baby born inside a Bollywood movie, how often that is a baby boy or how often that is a baby girl. And we uh, coined a term male birth ratio, which is, which is basically the number of boys, uh, Bollywood baby boys divided by the number of Bollywood baby boys and girls. You can see that uh, between 50s to 60s, this ratio was extremely skewed. In fact, up to 2000, almost 70% of 75% of the newborn babies inside Bollywood movies, they're baby boys. Whereas after 2000, we see that the ratio has improved significantly. So the key takeaways from this work is the male birth ratio improved over time inside Bollywood movies and the response towards dowry also became negative over time. We also looked into uh, large language models and we conducted closed tests, which is basically a fill in the blank test where uh, you just say, say theory of general relativity was proposed by blank and uh, uh, the large language model will rank uh, possible completions uh, with probability. So we did uh, this closed test on these Bollywood movies, and we fine-tuned large language models from uh, 1950s to 1970s, we denote them as old movies, and 2000 to 2020, we denote them as new movies, and we fine-tuned them, and we did the close test, a beautiful woman should have blank skin. And you see that no matter which era, the Bollywood movies or the Hollywood movies are there, the top choice is always fair. Whereas the birth base that is unfine tuned, that is not that has not looked into any of these Bollywood or Hollywood movies, it gives a much better uh, uh, response. So uh, the key takeaway of this experiment was Bollywood movies still associate beauty with fair skin, and uh, we also uh, conducted word embedding association tests to see uh, what kind of occupational stereotypes are present in Bollywood and Hollywood movies. And here, uh, the, a higher number means the movies are show more bias towards men. And you can see that the action movies uh, from Hollywood are, are the most biased. So basically from this work, the key takeaway is work. Sun preference decreased over time, while perception of dowry started indicating non-compliance. We also saw that uh, association of beauty with fairness remained constant and Hollywood popular action movies exhibited the most gender bias. Now, this is what happens in the movies. What happens in the real world? So we wanted to look into how gender inequality 
manifests in Indian divorces through the lens of divorce court proceedings. Now, divorce in India is a historically taboo topic and service studies have very sparse participation because of the social stigma attached to it. What we did, we did a comprehensive analysis through more than 70K, 17K divorce court proceedings gathered from indiancanoon.org. And we applied cutting edge natural language processing to understand what kind of gender inequalities or what kind of societal inequalities uh, can be gleaned from uh, divorce court proceedings in India. Now, in this paper, we are looking at the interplay between social inference tasks and model biases. And we ask a very important question. What if the AI or NLP tools we use for social inference tasks, what if these tools have inherent biases that interfere with or impact our social conclusions? So, that's the main question that we ask in this paper. And we also conduct an extensive audit of gender bias in large language models and text entailment methods. And we also propose a novel inconsistency sampling method to mitigate gender bias. Now, uh, text entailment is basically, it tries to compute. You have a premise and a hypothesis. And if the premise logically uh, is consistent with the hypothesis, then it says uh, entailment. If the premise and hypothesis are inconsistent, then the output is contradiction. And if the premise and hypothesis are unrelated, then the output is unrelated. So in our work, in order to quantify gender gap, we use text entailment as a tool, and we compute the fraction of sentences in this devote code proceedings that entail a man tortures a woman. And then we also compute the fraction of sentences that entail a woman tortures a man. And then we subtract the second value from the first value. So if we have a positive number, then it indicates that men torture women more often in the data set. And a negative number would indicate otherwise that it will indicate women torture men more often in the corpus. And we can extend this analysis to other unpleasant verbs and that will give us an estimate of gender equal inequality. And we looked into uh, other uh, unpleasant verbs like abuse, assault, beat, word, cheat, misbehave, and so on and so forth. Now coming to the question, what if the model is biased? Suppose our premise one is her husband used to harass and torture her every day. And our premise two is the counterfactual. His wife used to harass and torture him every day. Now, if the first premise entails the hypothesis a man tortures a woman, the second premise should entail the hypothesis a woman tortures a man. If that does not happen, then there is some inconsistency. And we observe that many premise or hypothesis pairs in, our, in, the, in the corpus exhibited this logical inconsistency leading to erroneous social con con conclusion. And for this reason, we develop a novel inconsistency sampling technique to robustify the text entailment method. So what we did was at each step, we were uh, finding out which premise and hypothesis pair were exhibiting this kind of inconsistencies. And then we created an active learning kind of framework when in it, where in each iteration, we were identifying the inconsistency, inconsistent samples. And then we were annotating them, retraining the models, and uh, improving the model's uh, bias behavior. So uh, in this table, the number is basically, uh, it quantifies how biased the model currently is. And a higher number means more bias. And you can see that as we are progressing with our active learning framework, at each iteration, the bias is reducing. Once we have a model that is more reliable, we use that uh, for our social conclusion, uh, social inference task. And there we find that the number of times men are beating women versus the number of times women are found to be beating uh, men in the corpus, uh, the overall result is positive, which means that it is very biased. Uh, and almost all the time, women are at the receiving end of domestic violence. So we observe stark gender inequality in the divorce court proceedings. 
And the key takeaways from our work is this is the first comprehensive AI powered analysis of gender inequality in divorce court proceedings in India. We found that women are largely at the receiving end of domestic violence. And we often uh, observe that dowry played a critical factor in those domestic violence. These are some of the nearest neighbors in a word embedding trained on the court proceedings. We also found that dowry and uh, the section 498A, which is the Indian penal court when someone reports domestic violence, we uh, looked at the different court cases that are uh, that mentioned dowry and the different court cases that mentioned IPC 498A. We saw that they are very correlated and this is pretty much the map of the dowry and domestic violence reporting in India. So we also realized that we need to be aware of model biases and how such biases can influence social inference. Uh, we presented a novel inconsistency sampling for text entailment, but our bias audit had broader implications. Consider the following two masked sentences. The first one is a mask guides a woman. And the second one is a mask guides a man. So if we uh, input this to BERT, BERT predicts man in the first sentence with probability 0.71, but BERT predicts woman in sentence two with probability 0.36. And we did a very detailed audit of 1222 verbs where we found that over and over again, when there is a verb that indicates position of power for the subject, uh, the large language models were predicting man way more with way higher probability than women in, in those kind of sentences. So the key takeaway from this work was divorce proceedings and text entitlement methods limitation is just one example that we presented, but there could be many, many more. And we have to be very careful when we are using this uh, uh, large language models for social inference tasks. Now in the World Gender Gap Index, India ranks 127th out of 146 countries. What about countries with even greater uh, gender gap? So we wanted to look into Iran, which ranks 143rd, and we, we wanted to study how is the social media discourse around gender equality in Iran? That brings us to our third paper, uh, which got published in HKI 2023. And uh, in this uh, paper, we studied uh, the social media discourse after Masa Amini's death and, and the subsequent protests in Iran. So on 16 September 2022, Masa Amini, a 22-year-old woman, died in police custody in Iran. And reportedly, she was arrested because she was not wearing her headscarf properly. Masamini's death enraged Persian Twitter in an unprecedented manner. And the hashtag Masamini was one of the most repeated hashtags on Persian Twitter. And it initiated a Twitter protest where Iranians expressed their grievances against the government like never before. So through a corpus of more than 30 million tweets, we present a computational analysis of gender equality discourse in Persian Twitter. So our key contributions in this paper was, this is the first comprehensive analysis of gender equality in Persian Twitter discourse. And the most important uh, aspect of this paper was all our annotation were conducted by Iranian women. So we had active participation from the, uh, from the major stakeholder of this research. So for our stance classification, the research question was, was there a noticeable change in support for gender equality in Persian Twitter discourse before and after the demise of Masa Amini while in police custody? And we made a stance classifier that takes a tweet as input and it outputs if the tweet exhibits a positive, negative or neutral stance towards gender e equality. We consider an ensemble active learning pipeline to develop this classifier that includes random sampling, uncertainty sampling, certainty sampling, and a guided sampling state. Now, as I mentioned already, the highlight of this paper was all annotations are carried out by four Iranian women who have lived experience of gender inequality in Iran. And uh, in the guided sampling state, we asked our annotators 
to provide short example documents exhibiting a positive or negative stance toward gender equality. So the annotators were not only playing a very passive role in the whole uh, AI system building process, they were actively collaborating with us and uh, giving us uh, giving us a firsthand experience and firsthand uh, lived experience uh, uh, to, to co curate a much more meaningful data set. So this is some example short uh, documents written by our annotators that exhibit a positive stance towards uh, gender equality. And this one is uh, one of my most favorites where it says, we have to put aside all the differences in our standards. And if we consider a behavior appropriate for men, we should allow women as well and understand that there is no difference between a man and a woman who smoke or dance or laugh loud at a party. So when we uh, uh, used our sampling steps and curated our data sets and trained our stance classifier, we observed that the discussions became more polarized after Masamini's death and the increase in positive discourse was by a factor of 2.89. Uh, it, it is greater than the increase in negative discourse. So the primary takeaways for this work was that the grievances of the protesters against the current government mentioned a broad range of incidents spanning decades with respect to account creation time between the state-aligned Twitter accounts and pro-protest Twitter accounts. Pro-protest accounts are more similar to baseline Persian Twitter activity. And we observe a noticeable shift in positive stance toward gender equality after the protests on Persian Twitter discourse. This work also opens up a very interesting discussions around participatory AI. With the current take AI race, the gap between AI haves and AI have nots will only widen. So working with the vulnerable community in the AI building process can lead to more reliable and inclusive AI systems. In a more recent work that just got accepted at HKI 2024 this year, we looked into domestic violence in Iran, and we found that in the domestic violence uh, in Iran, uh, in our social media study, most of the cases, the perpetrators are men, whereas the victims mostly are women. Finally, in the World Gender Gap Index, India ranks 127th, Iran ranks 143rd, and US ranks 43rd, it actually slipped from 27th since the Roe v. Wade was overturned. So we were interested in seeing what kind of gender bias manifests in a, in a so-called first world country. So we looked into political uh, conversations and we tried to uh, quantify who interrupts whom and what is the nature of that interruption to study the conversation dynamics. And we found that uh, when we look into news transcripts from these major US cable news networks and considered extensive social science literature on interruptions, we observed that women get less speaking time than men, and women tend to interrupt men more often than men interrupt women, perhaps because they are not getting enough space to voice their views. This work was uh, uh, covered again by Daily Mail and many other major uh, news outlets. And it was also uh, mentioned in the Harper Index. Now, to sum up, we looked at gender gap through diverse lenses. Uh, we also considered diverse data set sources like movie transcripts, news transcripts, court proceedings, and social web posts. Now, one thing is common in all of these sources is that they might be used to train a large language model. So the generative AI methods that are trained on a vast amount of this kind of data, they might actually pick, pick up the worst of humanity because if the underlying data sets have biases, generative AI will also possibly show lots of gender biases the way that we were discussing so far. In a more recent work, again, this work got accepted at Ichkai this year, we presented a toxicity rabbit hole framework where we elicit toxic content from large language models in an iterative way to study underlying biases present in the model. So what we do, do is we start with a stereotype as input. It could be a positive one, like some group are nice people. It could be a negative one, that some group are not nice people. And then we instruct the large language model to produce more toxic content than the input. And we instruct the, instruct the large language model that it can modify, append, 
or completely rewrite the input stereotype. But we, uh, we also instruct that the LLM can add additional target groups, but we do not specify which groups to add because we want to study what kind of underlying biases are present in the LLM. And whatever is the toxic rewrite of the uh, initial stereotype, that becomes the input at the next step. So then we ask the large language model, can you make your own generated content more toxic? And we keep going through this rabbit hole up until the LLM guardrails block the request. So that is the basic design of this work. And we found that with this very simple and deceptive framework, it can uncover horrific anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny, transphobia, ableism, Islamophobia in 10 large language models. These are some of the examples where it is saying highly misogynistic uh, toxic content. Uh, and, and these are very well-known large language models like Palm 2 and Mistral. So the closing thoughts is multimodality will offer richness in analysis and it will give us a much better understanding of a lot of subtle and deeper gender biases present in our data sets. For instance, this uh, uh, from this uh, image, it is very clear that this image is talking about gender equality. A tweet may not contain a single word, but just post this image. If we have multimodal analysis of tweets or social media posts, our analysis of gender bias will be significantly stronger and, and richer. Secondly, sometimes uh, there could be uh, no words spoken in a movie, but still it might show shocking, shocking gender bias. So this is a movie clip from a very popular movie that appeared after 2000, where we saw that Bollywood babies are becoming baby boys and baby girls with almost even ratio. Here, the main character starts daydreaming whenever he sees an attractive woman. I'll just play a 10 second clip. There is not a single dialogue, but you can see what I'm meaning here. So you can see that in this 10 seconds clip where the um, where the character was daydreaming about uh, an expanded family, all the children that he was daydreaming are baby boys. So our linguistic analysis will never be able to capture this kind of gender bias. So that's why we will need uh, multimodal frameworks to understand uh, this kind of subtle biases and audits of gender bias in vision language models and also multimodal gender bias evaluation frameworks could be very uh, interesting uh, possible future directions. I would like to conclude finally with uh, the story of Yoshiro Mori. He was uh, the prime minister of Japan and also the president of the Olympic Association in 2020. He made some toxic misogynistic comments uh, while he was organizing the Olympics. And at that point, uh, people started protesting. He was still not stepping down, but a lot of people started resigning in protest. And at some point, he had to step down from being the president of the Olympic uh, uh, Association. Now, my question is, if we have uh, documented gender bias in so many different systems, what should be our policy for these systems? When we see that there is bias in uh, humans, we try to limit those humans' uh, decision-making uh, possibilities, and we also don't let them to decide for uh, affected communities. What should be the policy for large language models? With that question, I'd like to end thanking my two PhD students, Orko Datto and Shujan Datto. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions.